We're doing the top 10 teachings on the Talmud Brachos Daf 44. The first one is going to be about what happens when you're eating bread or toast, but it's only to offset a very salty or extreme spicy taste of fish, like a jalapeno herring. Would you make the regular hamotzi on the piece of toast when it's only really there to accompany the the super saltiness? Uh, and the answer, the simple answer is you, you only make a blessing on the salty fish, but we'll discuss that in more detail. The second point is uh, about the fruits of Ganesar. The, the Talmud talks about these amazing fruits that were considered possibly the most important fruit. The only problem is they were so delicious, you never really got satisfied. You needed to eat more. And apparently they were really good. People would get, would go mad temporarily from eating the fruits. And number three is the Mishnah that talks about Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Akiva. We could just imagine them walking into a fruit bar and having a, an argument, as they often did, about the nature of the requirement to make a blessing, a grace after meal, whether it's a fruit as well as bread, whether it's only whether you're really satisfied or, or not. And that's uh, three. Number four is we're going to learn about the, the uh, short version, the bracham ein shalosh, the smaller version of what we would make on the special fruits that Israel is praised with. It's very apropos because Tu is tomorrow night, and that's the Al Ha'etz. And then we're also going to read about number five, the Al Ha'michya, for things we say on Mizonot, like uh, when we've eaten crackers or a slice of pizza, or where it's not a Berchat Hamazon for having eaten bread, it's the Al Ha'michya. And number six is how we conclude on Shabbos and Yantif. And number seven is, do we make a bracha after we've completed a mitzvah? And, and we generally don't, but there's some people who did when they would take off the tefillin and possibly for other mitzvot. And number eight is, usually when we benefit from something from this world, we make an after blessing. Like when we eat or drink, we make a blessing, not just before, but also after. But when you enjoy something smell, you make no blessing after. So we're going to talk about that. Number nine is the Talmud says eggs are better ounce per ounce against any other food. And number 10, which is connected to number nine, is the Talmud's concern for our health and their tips, which we may not take quite literally or literally at all today, or perhaps understand that uh, they meant something back in the day, but we don't really understand how to apply them today. So that's the overview. And with that in mind, we will now launch into the uh, more detailed version of that. And um, as I mentioned before, it is Tu So I'll just say a little something about Tu and maybe we can, uh, we can tie it in more specifically. And of course, if you really are interested in Tu Bishvat, please join me on Tu Bishvat on Wednesday night. Uh, the Shul's hosting a Tu Bishvat Seder. But a couple things about, about Tu Bishvat and Brachot and blessings. When, when, um, when you make certain blessings, what you're really doing is you're connecting specifically to the the type of food that you're eating you're you're being grateful not just for being sustained and nourished but also for the fact that god made a great variety of different foods and for good and for bad because i say it's good because we enjoy ourselves by eating different foods but for bad sometimes we enjoy ourselves so much that we don't know when to stop we we have such a rich a world, universe that we live in, and the land itself, the produce of the land, the fruits and the vegetables, and and of course, the if you're not a vegan, the eggs and the cheese and so on and the, and the meat, 
they all provide us with different levels of of appetite and 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 desire and and taste and there's a beautiful teaching which says that we make a special acknowledgement when we have a fruit of the tree, which is al ha'aretz al ha'peros, or even al ha'aretz al peros seha, which if you're living in the land of Israel, you change the blessing to reflect on the land and its fruits, meaning that we acknowledge the special fruits that Israel is praised with. And what that represents, and even if we live outside of Israel, we still acknowledge that these fruits are somehow connected to the praise of the land of Israel because of the greatness of the bounty of these fruits. And what that, one rabbi had a problem with that. He says, what, is that the reason why somebody will think about making Aliyah? Is that the reason why we say, that we say that God should, you know, look upon Zion as as we are returning with his compassion because of the fruits. Like I have friends who want to go to Israel because they have the best falafel. I mean, they want to live in Israel because of the falafel. Is that, is that really going to be the thing that gets you to make Aliyah or to want to live in Israel, to love Israel? Well, one of the rabbis in defending this said, actually, yes, because if you taste the fruit and it's so delicious, it must mean that if the fruit is so delicious, how much more precious is the land that the fruit came out of? And he says even more, I was actually crying when I read this. It was so, touched me so deeply. He said, when you taste the fruit, you can actually taste the shechina in the fruit. You can taste the divine presence that's more powerful and palpable in the land of Israel. So when I when I saw that I was like wow that's that's heavy and it, I I wasn't even preparing for Tubishvat I'm just simply preparing uh, I was preparing for this daf and it happened to be really so powerful and just in the back of the Talmud the, in in the, the halacha section of one of the uh, one of the gemaras I have the most of the rough cook puts out the uh, this uh, beer halacha it's got a halachic uh, uh, anthology in the back, and and they bring this down, this comment down. It was like, wow, worth the price of the safer. So that's a little intro that connects us to the day that's coming, to Bishvat that's happening in 24 hours, less than 24 hours. But with that in mind, let's go to our beautiful page of Gemara and start with the Mishnah. The Mishnah sounds like it could be a conundrum presented to a rabbi, perhaps in the five towns or in uh, Bell Harbor, uh, in South Florida. What to do if they bring a very salty fish? Now, the way I would say it today is that reminds me of a jalapeno herring, particularly uh, Roskins. There's two... Bensies or Roskins, jalapeno herring. They're both vying for really tremendous, tasty, delicious herring. Now, the jalapeno herring, especially if you're Ashkenazi, is quite sharp. So anybody who knows what they're doing knows that you have to have a little cracker or a little piece of bread or a little piece of toast to not uh, burn your tongue if you're consuming the herring. And after all, you're probably having some scotch with it. So you need the herring to counteract the scotch and you need the bread to counteract the herring. So what bracha do you make here? So the Mishnah actually tells us that when you have the salty fish with, a little, with some bread to accompany it, you only make a blessing on the fish, and that permits you to eat the toast or the bread as well. Now, why is that? Shapast failalah, because the bread is, is secondary or subservient or or not as important. It, it's like uh, it's like a, it, it accompanies it. 
And Zehaklal, there's a there's a rule here. Kol shu iker v'imot fela. Whatever is primary, and with it is something that's subservient to it, so to speak. I don't know if I'm subservience is the right word. Um, subordinate. It's the art scroll. V'varachal the iker partas tefila. All you do is make a blessing on the primary thing, and that will cover the subordinate thing. Now, the Gemara is going to have an issue with this, but before we get to the Gemara, uh, before we get to that, let's let's learn this the way the Yerushalmi learns it, which is perhaps reconcilable with our Gemara. There's a Machlokis Rishonim of how to read our Gemara, which is based on whether you want to reconcile the Yerushalmi with the Babli. The Yerushalmi points out uh, on this same Mishnah that that's not the custom today. In other words, the Yerushalmi is saying, good, in the time of the Mishnah, that people did that. Obviously, the Mishnah says it. That's what used to happen. People used to eat really salty fish, and um, they'd eat, it was an appetizer, basically. In other words, it wasn't part of the meal, because the, the question that the Yerushalmi and the Babli are both bothered by is, what do you mean? Didn't you, don't you start eating by washing your hands, having a piece of bread, and then serving various appetizers. So the Yerushalmi basically says, yeah, that's how we do it today. But back in the day, in the time of the Mishnah, they'd first serve appetizers. They wouldn't wash their hands for hamotzi because they, didn't, they weren't having the main meal yet. They were maybe going to eat for half hour, an hour, some light fare, maybe have a, a cup of wine with it. And... Um, that being the case, that made sense back then. Now the, the Yerushalmi says, we, nobody does that anymore. Everybody eats the fish as part of the meal. So you would, you would in effect, um, make, uh, make hamotzi nowadays. But back in the day of the Mishnah, fine. If you're eating uh, jalapeno herring, fancies or raskins, you didn't have to make a bracha on the piece of toast that accompanied it. Okay, so that's a very powerful thing. Most people never heard of this thing. And for good reason, because we, because the reason why you've never heard of it is, is simply because, lighting is bad here, well, we'll figure it out. So what's, what's the reason why you never heard of this? It's very simple. The, the Shulchan Aruch rules that this only applies that your that that the saltiness or spiciness of the salty fish would hurt you. In other words, you need the bread to kind of take away the bitterness that would. Um, I don't want to say the word danger, but yeah, like could be unhealthy for you. So that's kind of extreme. I'd say even the jalapeno herring, it's it it it, it goes down easier with with. Uh, uh, a piece of, of toast, but it's not like you ate the actual habanero or jalapeno pepper straight up. And then it's like, ah, it's burning your mouth. And if you don't put in some bread, it's like there's a fire in you. So because of that, that's the re because the, the, the halacha reflects that stricter mentality that's apparent in the Yushalmi and even more in the Babli. In other words, normal people, we don't do that like that. So we, we, we make it only in this rare case. So that's number one. Let's look at number two, which is about the fruits of Ganesha. Let me first tell you about the fruits of Ganesha, and then I'm going to tie it into the Gemara. So the, the fruits of Ganesha are, the Gemara has a reason why it's going to tell us about these fruits. But the, 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 the problem that the Gemara has is similar to the Yerushalmi, um, and it's not clear, like I said, the Rishonim debate how to learn the Babli, if it could be in tandem with the Yerushalmi or if it's arguing on the Yerushalmi. So what is it that the Babli says? The, 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 the Babli says there's no such thing as eating salty fish with bread that the, that, that the bread could be the tuffle, the subordinate. It doesn't exist. Bread is substantial and fish is less important. In other words, either they felt that that was always the case, or if you want to learn like the Rishalmi, at this point in history, a couple hundred years after the Mishnah, 
the bread is by and large how we start something off. So what, how could it ever be that you're eating salty fish without having already started your meal with bread? So that would be the reconciliation of the Bible and the Rishami, or that the, the Bible just holds that bread is incredible. There's no way fish can be more important than, than bread. And therefore, it rejects the simple reason, the reading of the Mishnah. And instead, it substitutes a new reading of the Mishnah. What's the new reading of the Mishnah? You have to say, the Gemara tells us, that the people were eating Peros Ganesar. Ganesar is uh, Tiveria. Wonderful, beautiful place in Israel. You might know it because of uh, the restaurant Dex over the over the river, or over the the Kinneret. Okay? It's the Kinneret in Tveria. That's Ganesar. They have the best fruits. Those fruits are so good. They are more valuable than bread. They are so important that bread is secondary to them. Okay, so let me let me walk us through this scenario. You're being served these mind-blowingly delicious fruits. Tu Bishvat, it's a Gemara that says these beautiful fruits, these delicious fruits are more significant than any other food. That's how important they are. But because they're so amazing, you're losing your mind from it. It's like, it's too much. You need to bring yourself down. You need something salty. So you eat a little salt, a little salty fish to um, take away the extreme sweetness that you're experiencing. And then, now that you're, now, now you counteracted the sweetness with the salty and the spicy, you got to take that away also. Now you need a, a piece of bread. In that case, the Gemara says that's when you don't make a bracha on the bread because the bread is subservient to the main event, which is the fruits. And because of the fruits, you need the salty thing. And then because of the salty thing, you need the bread. So that's how the Gemara interprets it. And uh, like I said, there's two ways of reading that to be shown and read it in two different ways. Either you reconcile it with the Yerushalmi and say the time of the Gemara was different than the time of the Mishnah. It was just a, a, ch a change in emphasis of how they ate, or the Babli argues in the Yerushalmi. Okay. Now, let's look a little further. Tosus asks a question and says, if the main thing are the fruits, why are you even making a bracha on the salty thing? You should just make a ha'etz. Then, the fruit counteract or or like subdue the sweetness, which is meaning it's a subordinate. It, it's just accompanying the sweetness of the fruit and accompanying the, the saltiness of the salty fish is the bread to kind of counteract that. So all you make is one bracha and that covers all three things. So the Tosis has two answers. One of the answers is it could be that you ate all the, the fruits and, and you're done with the fruits. And you didn't have it, you didn't plan it out so meticulously. And now that you're done with the fruits, you, you take the, the, the jalapeno herring. And, and now that you have the jalapeno herring, you're like, oh God, I really need something to counteract that. So it happened disconnected from the original sitting down. So this, the, the idea of, of a, a separate eating means even if they're related, but because there was a hesachadas, there was a, a removal of the, of, of the, activity of eating in the person's mind and a restarting of eating, even if it was somehow caused by the first eating, it doesn't matter. It's considered like it needs a new bracha. So that's why it needs a second bracha for the salty fish. Does not need a bracha for the hamotzi because the hamotzi is subservient, not so much to the fish, but to the experience of having eaten the fruits of Ganesa, which is an interesting paradigm because it's telling us that really the bread is tafel, is subordinate to the fruit. But you're no longer being covered by the bracha of the fruit because you've stopped eating fruit and now you're eating salty things. But because there's still a subordination of a greater food, it still takes away the bracha of the hamotzi uh, and, and, and all you have to do is make a bracha on the salty fish. So that's number two. The Gemara actually, I, I told you, it might even lead you to madness. I don't know if anybody can can help me out here and tell me if there if you can get delirious from eating fruits. It the the Talmud says that Rabbi Yochanan would collect I think a thousand 
have his students collect a thousand fruits. That might be a metaphor. Yeah, a thousand fruits. And um, Rush Luckish would start going crazy or delirious. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasiya, right, not to be mixed up with Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, this is a descendant of his, actually. Um, or am I wrong? Uh, would send a troop to bring him home because he was dangerous. Remember, Rashlakish was a bandit, so there's there's some that he has a predisposition to to wildness in him. So that's a little bit about this this uh, fruits of Ganesar. Okay, the Gemara also discusses other wonderful things about the land of Israel, its bounty, and some other interesting tidbits and facts about a city called Gufnis that had 80 pairs of brothers and sisters. Uh, and the, and the, each brother would marry, they would marry like pairs, obviously not a brother marrying a sister, but They'd marry pairs, and they were calling them on both sides, and that was a rarity. And also, Rob says any meal that doesn't have salt in it isn't a meal. I know that the Meashiloh talks about salt as as um, as something that tames kind of the passion. It, it, it controls the wildness. So there's a beautiful Ishpitzer. I shared a little bit of it in the past. So we're going to continue with the mission now, which is number three about Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Gamliel walking into a fruit bar. The Mishnah says, Achal te'enim, I'm sorry, Achal te'anavim v'te'enim v'yimonim. If a person eats grapes, figs, pomegranates, one or more of the above, so mevarech achrehem shalosh brachos. One makes a blessing, according to the first opinion, of the birchas hamazon, the same or equivalent of what we would make for bread. Divrei Rabbi Gamliel. That's the words of Rabbi Gamliel. We obviously don't follow that ruling. The sages say, you make it a, a shorter version of that, what we call the al ha'etz, or the al, like, like, which is like the al ha which is a paragraph, not for paragraphs. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Afilo achal shalek v'hu mizono mevarech alav shalosh brachos. If somebody eats even cooked vegetables, and definitely if they eat fruits, definitely fruits that the land of Israel was praised with, and they're full, they have to make the full, the, the, the after blessing, the birchad amazon, that we, we don't rule like Rabbi Akiva either, because we only make the after blessing when you eat bread. But Rabbi Akiva didn't understand the verse that says that you shall eat and be satisfied and bless God to be limited to simply when you eat bread. Rabbi Gamliel, the Gemara will explain, didn't believe that that verse was limited to when we eat bread, but also would include the seven species that the land of Israel is being praised with, the chit, the se'ora, the, the, the gefa, and the tain of Arimon, different, different um, grains, and that, that if you ate mizonos even, or if you had the fruits like the, the, the dates, uh, the, the olives and pomegranates that the land of Israel is prayed with, that's because what it is is the verse actually says, this is the Talmud explains this, that, um, that Rabbi Gamliel says the verse tells us Eretz Chita Sa'ara, the Gafen, a land flowing, uh, a land of, of uh, wheat, barley, and grape, etc. And uh, grapes, figs, and pomegranates, a land of, of olive oil and, and dates, or date honey. And then it says, a land that you will eat bread without poverty. And then it says, a little, you know, I'm, I'm skipping a little, a couple words here. And then it says, you'll eat and be satisfied and you'll bless Hashem your God. 
So if we read that as one continuum, the verse is telling us when you eat these special foods that the land of Israel is praised with, you have to make a birchad hamazon. The rabbis disagree. They say, Eretz hipsika inyan. There's an extra time where the Torah introduces for seemingly unnecessarily the word Eretz. Eretz, the land, a shalom and miskein is talk about that. You don't, won't eat with, with, you won't eat bread uh, with poverty or you won't eat it you won't eat bread without poverty, in, in which you will eat bread without poverty. Tongue twister for me. I don't know why. Probably because it's late. So that interrupts it. And then, therefore, when it says the initial verse of Eretz Kita Sa'ara, the land of the barley and, and, and wheat and, and olives and all that, it's interrupted purposefully to designate that that's not included in the verse that will come after of uh, you, you eat and, and be satisfied and it does mention again bread before right before that and therefore uh because it says lechem talk about lechem so therefore that according to the sages is the reason why only bread lechem do we have to make the birch so that's number three mm -hmm. number four is a little bit about al ha'etz. So the Gemara. So so again, these are the fruits that the land of Israel is praised for: the figs, the dates, the olives, the pomegranates, the grapes that we make. This al ha'etz. So the Gemara introduces to us what it is, and tells us the following. What is the bracha me'en shalosh? Now, why is it called an abridged version of three? Because it was understood that there was three original blessings the rabbis instituted based on the biblical verse that says, It says you should eat and be satisfied on the, uh, um, bless the Lord your God, on the good land that he has given you. So there, there, in addition to thanking God, you also have to acknowledge the land. So we've got the, the blessings of the thanks the, uh, on the bread itself, the blessing on, on, um, on the land. And... Um, then we have, I'm going to show you how this fits in, the three blessings, into this smaller script of the Ha'etz and the al -Hamichia. So how, how does that work? So we say, al priya eats, right? We say, al eats val priya eats. On the fruit, we start off with, of course, Baruch Atah Hashem. Blessed are you, Hashem. You know, Lekenu, our God, Malach Ha'olam, the King of the World, and then we say, Al Ha'etz Val Pri Eitz on the tree and the fruit of the tree, Val Tenuvat Hasadeh on the produce of the field, Val Eretz Chemda Tova Erchava, and for the desirable land which is good and gracious or, or spacious. Shin that you 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 gave as an inheritance to our forebears. So right away we have those two things that I mentioned. You have the blessing for God sustaining us with with nourishing food, and you have the mention of the 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 promise of this desirable land. Okay, so that's two of the three, um, and which we're lechol mipriyav the soil mituva to eat from its fruits and to be satisfied with its produce. Now, number three, Rachim Hashem Elokeinu Al Yisrael Amecha, God have mercy on your people, Israel, va'al Yisraelim and Jerusalem, your city, va'mikdashcha on your temple, va'mizbachecha on your altar. Which is interesting because that's not in the bigger version of the Birchat Hamazon. 
V'sivna Yushalayim Ir Kachecha V'mehevi Yameinu. It's slightly different than what we have in the Siddur, but it's the same, essentially. And may you rebuild Jerusalem, the holy city, quickly in our days. V'alenu l'socha v'samcheinu ba. And bring us up to it and let us rejoice with it. Ki atatov v'metiv l'kol. For you are good and you do good to all. So, let's leave aside the ending. For you are good and everything else I just said after number one and two is all about God have compassion on us and Jerusalem and in your temple. It's all about basically Kibbutz Galiot coming back into the land of Eretz Yisrael. So that's number three. That, that corresponds to the third part of the Birchat Hamazon, which is the blessing for Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is not everybody has this, Kiata Tov Metiv Lakol, you are good, and you do good to all. That corresponds to the fourth blessing, Hatov which, which, the, the, which is the add-on. The rabbis added on after certain good things that happened to us, after they allowed us to bury the Haruge Beitar, and so on. Um, not everyone says that. Because they say it's, you know, maybe that wasn't instituted. So there's a debate about whether we say that or not. We I, we do most of us do, and that's the bracha that we make for al ha'etz when we have the special fruits that the land of Israel is praised with, and the al ha'michya, which is number five, the, the text and what we do al ha'michya for, is when we have things that are grains that are not bread, the the bread the type of things that we make into bread the wheat, the barley, the spelt, the rye, that we, we make it into a delicious porridge or or a, a cracker or, or a slice of pizza. So there we say the same, we say the same blessing, except the beginning and the end is different to reflect that it's not a fruit. So how is that? That is, Um, on the nourishment and the sustain sustenance and the produce of the field etc everything we just did but then the conclu concludes with on the fruit and uh, I'm sorry slip on the on the land and on the grain, or the nourishment, which is more associated with something like grain. And we don't end like that for the fruits. We'd end al ha'etz. We'd end a different ending for eights. Al ha'etz, al priya eights. So, uh, either, we, actually, we end with al ha'etz, al ha'peros. On blesses, baruch Hashem, you know, blessed are you, God, Al Arts Val Paris on the land and on and for the fruit or Val Parosa, its fruits. Depending on if we're in the land of Israel, it's its fruits. And if you're not in the land of Israel, it's the fruits. In fact, if you know for sure that you're eating fruits of the land of Israel, even outside of Israel, the uh Shokhanach rules that you should say for its fruits. So this is again where I mentioned this beautiful, beautiful teaching about the significance of blessing the land for its fruits. Even if you're not in Israel, even if the fruits are not from Israel, so much of this blessing revolves around the land of Israel. It's a reminder of the land of Israel. And one of the great commentaries, I'm going to look it up and tell you which one it is because it was so good, says, don't worry if it looks like you're you're crazy about the land of Israel because of its fruits, you're crazy about the land of Israel because even its fruits make you taste the taste of Shekhinah. Who says that? Something like that I need to tell you the source. So that is...
That's the Bach. My Heilige Zeta. Many generations ago, I had a I had a, a great rabbi named the Bach that I descend from. And now, now I know why. You know, I am like in awe of this Torah because he says when we taste the fruit of the land. Anuni zonim kedushat hashchina. We're receiving nourishment from the sanctity of the shchina that rests in the land, and it purifies, and it and it satiates it. it we are satiated from its goodness. I mean, that's the power of of this prayer and the power of Tu is this this amazing idea that we're tasting a fruit. And we're tasting divine sweetness in it. In fact, my daughter, uh, her name is Naomi. And a beautiful thing I read in Hasidut is Noam Li. Is sweetness is mine. Where God says, the, you know, we see sweet things in the world. We see sweet things that we eat. But to know that the ultimate sweetness belongs to me, to God. And to me, that is what this kind of Bach is teaching us, that when we taste the fruits of the land of Israel and we make the, the Birchad HaMazon in the land of Israel, we're literally tasting the sweetness of the Shekhinah. And God is telling us, sweetness is mine. It's a beautiful teaching of the Bach. Thank you, Heilige Zede, the Heilige Bach. Just for a moment, there's a discussion. There's a uh, what if you are not sure whether you made the Berchad Hamazam? You might have made it. You forget. You forget. You're not sure. Did I make it? Did I not make it? So there's a generally there's a principle that we say Safik Brachas Lahaka, which means when in doubt, you're lenient when it comes to Brachot. There is an exception. There's very few exceptions to this rule. There is an exception that says that if you're not sure whether you made the Berchad Hamazam after bread. Then you should make if you have a obligation to to really um, make a, a bechad amazon. You ate a real meal with a lot of bread, then and you were full from it. Then, even if you're in doubt, out of doubt, you it's a it's a, a, a raisa. Usually, we say when there's a doubt in a biblical thing, you should do the thing out of doubt, even though you may have done it, you may not be required to. But you, you speak of the arise of the Chumrah. When it comes to a doubt in a biblical area, you're stricter. So you, you, you do it again, or maybe it's the first time. You don't know how to doubt. But what about bracha achrona for the fruits that Israel is praised with? The, the Allah eats, while Priya eats, or al hamichya, the bracha achrona, the blessing after eating the cake or cookies or, or donuts or crackers or porridge. Um, or or a piece of pizza. What what about if you don't remember whether you made the ala mikyar or the ala eitz? So then the 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 halacha is that you don't make it suffik brachas lahakya. But interesting, there is a debate amongst the the rishonim about if ala mikyar is the rice or not. It's really a big debate. But lemaisa we we don't we don't uh, make the 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 ala mikyar out of doubt. We say suffik brachas lahakya. Could be because we rule according to the uh, opinion that says it's midir banan. I'm trying to think if there's a way where you can reconcile and say that it could be midir and we still say suffik brachas naka. That'd be a big chidush to say that. To say that in other words, to say that there could that there are some times that there's a leniency in brachot even if there's a zad araita. There's there's a, a daraita uh, element to it. Perhaps you can say. It seems from, from our Gemara that it's not the Araita. Only, only Birchad Amazon after bread is the Araita. That's what it seems from our Gemara. But yet, great Rishonim don't re, you know, have other Gemaras that, that they read that make the point that it is a Daraisa and Allah Mechia. So I'm trying to like help reconcile the different Shittas. I'm still working that out. But the ruling is, bottom line, is if you're in doubt when it comes to Allah Mechia, uh, or or Allah eats or Allah Guffin, 
you don't have to make that out of doubt because Suffolk Brachas Lahatka. Okay, so that was number four and five. Now we get to the ending. How do you end these uh, this this bracha? It doesn't mention anything here, but Tosas brings down the Yerushalmi. Okay, let's take a look at Tosvos. The Yerushalmi says that you mention Shabbos and Yantiv in the Alamechia. Right? Like if you look even till today, it says in the Siddur that you say if it's Shabbos, it's Sevach Litzenev Yom Shabbos Hazeh, or if it's Yantif or or Rosh Chodesh, either Yom Chag Hamatzos or Chag Asukos or whatever holiday it is, or on Rosh Chodesh you say Yom Rosh Chodesh Hazeh, and then you conclude the prayer. Hiyata Shem Tov Meiti Lakov Nedel Chal Aretz Val Hamichya Baruch Ata Shem Al Aretz Val Hamichya. Or if it's on Peirot, with the appropriate blessing, on wine on the appropriate blessing. But the truth is, is that Tosa says, no, we, we, we find that the Yerushalmi mentions it, but that we don't practice it. Now, again, the halacha is not like Tosa. The halacha is like uh, the Rambam, the Paskins like the Yerushalmi, and like the Siddur that I just quoted to you. But let's understand, let's tell, it's still Torah, you know, part of learning Gemara is even it's not all practical it's about what's behind the scenes because if you ever want to a, a it's interesting b if you ever want to be a rav if you ever want to be a rabbi you have to see what's behind the scenes because that could help you uh, make a psak when when the, the halacha is not clear or you want to help somebody uh, keep the halacha and and you have to go back to the kind of to the sources to see so the tosa says that Omiu lo nagu he quotes the Yerushalmi that they would they would say this this uh, and he quotes the say from Hamaimoni sounds like the Rambam isn't necessarily but I think in this case it is. Uh, usually isn't. There is something. Hagos Maimon is, is not the Rama, but Sefer Maimoni, in this case, I believe is the Rama. Um, he says, You have to mention the, the holiday, and that's also the what's Mashma as the the Yushami, meaning the Yushami is a discussion about it. It seems like that's what the Yushami says to do. He says, However, Lo Nagu Ha'olam Kain. That's not what the oilam, meaning the people don't have this custom. Now, it could be that it was specifically in their days that they would mention the Shabbos or Yantif because they would be koveya, a meal, meaning they would establish more of a meal on fruits or on, on a donut. But in our time, that's not really a significant meal. We just, that's a tiny little snack. You eat a, you eat a, you eat a grape. You're not you're not satisfying yourself like that. Um, okay, and then there's about how to combine two or three of these things when you're eating mizonot and and let's say drinking wine or the fruits. You can combine them, and um, There's there's some some brisker Torah I'm going to share with you on this, and you know look the Babli doesn't mention this this thing. So also there's a question of of even the Yerushalmi mentions it, but it's only understood to be Shabbos holidays and Rosh Chodesh, not to be Hanukkah and Purim. There's no need to mention Hanukkah or Purim in the Alamithia or or the Ala Eitz. So we have to understand what the difference is. We have to talk a little bit about this and also talk about this earlier debate that I mentioned to you. Like, what is the, what is the, the bracha me'en shalosh, this abridged version of the grace after meals? Is it something that's entirely new and different, just rabbinic? Uh, and 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 only slightly resembles the biblical 
Birchad HaMazon, the actual full Birchad HaMazon, or is it really the same thing, but the rabbis felt they didn't need to make it quite as big, they just abridged it. So we mentioned that that's a machlokus. But even if it's, even if you, for argument's sake, say it's a dirabanan, which is the root, which is the law. It's only the Birchad HaMazon is seen as the oraita, lemaisa, meaning in practice today. The question can still be asked, did the rabbis institute it with pretty much the same laws as the bigger Bechad Masam? For example, there's a law that you're supposed to bench in the place that you ate. If you left the place, you don't have to go back, but if you left the place, for example, on purpose, then you really should go back. What about, that's for bread. What about for Mizanot? And there's a debate amongst the Bishonim if we treat it like Hamotzi or not. So perhaps you could say that the debate is what enactment did the rabbis institute? Is it really an extension of Berchad Mazon, just shorter, or is it its own thing? And the same thing can be asked about adding in the, the specialness of a holiday. If it's like Tosa says, you don't need to say it today, Meaning it's, uh, it was probably, you know, like, okay, you, you, they used to say it. You don't need to do it today. It could be because when the, the rabbis don't mention it in the Babli, they only mention it in the Yerushalmi. Why? Because they didn't institute it to be significant like the Birchad HaMazon, like the full, the full version. Therefore, you say it, good. You don't say the holiday, it doesn't matter. But it could be the Yerushalmi and the Ramah, the Pasim's like the Yerushalmi, they hold now. They hold... It's, it's, it's more, it, it could be that the Rambam sees the Me'en Shalosh, the, 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 the shorter version, as being an extension of the longer version. Okay. That's a simple reading of, a simple explanation. Rabbi Soloveitchik explains this in, in, in his own way. Um, let me see if I can find it. He's always good. My friend Rabbi Herschel Reichman. Um, should be well, very special man in his Rishim Shiurim, his notes from his, the lectures of Rabbi Soloveitchik, says, um, you could say, yeah, he basically, I was, I, what I said is basically the short version of what Rabbi Soloveitchik said. Okay, so he just, he just expands it a little more. Um, yeah, he just says it seems like the Rambam is the one that, that seems to indicate that the, the shorter version is, is just is based on all the foundational principles and shares the, the common laws for the most part with the bigger Bechad Amazon. And Tosus doesn't see it like that. Okay. Let's continue. There's more here, but let's continue to number uh, seven. The Gemara makes the statement and says that when it comes to something, we're not sure what it is. It's it's, it's kind of mysterious. You don't make a uh, a blessing after you do the thing. And the Gemara is trying to figure out what it is. Let me let me see if I can. I could find that inside for us. Um, okay. So, first of all, the, the Gemara talks about Shahakal. I kind of didn't make that its own thing. But the Gemara says that on eggs, meat, uh, you make a shahakal on the Borin and Fashos. We talked a little bit about the shahakal Borin and Fashos at an earlier year, So I guess hopefully I covered a significant amount of it. And then there's a discussion about vegetables, about uh, making the Borin and Fashos as well. And then there's a debate about water. But Lamaisa, on all these things, we make a blessing before and after. The shahakal before. And and the Borin of at the its conclusion. 
So, the Mishnah says, Kol it, it, it's a quote from, from Mishnah Anida, so it's not, you're not going to find it in Brachas, but it's in the Gemara. It's quoted in, in, on uh, 44b. Kol Shaton Bracha La'achrav Ton Bracha Lafana. Whatever you make a blessing for at the end needed to have a blessing on it in the beginning. The yes shaton bracha the fun of an ton bracha However, there's something or things that needs a bracha in the beginning, but not at the end. Now the, the Gemara says, okay, there were rabbis who said that you don't have to make a, a after blessing on water, so that or, or vegetables. We don't hold like that, but that's brought up. So. Perhaps that's what they're talking about. But what about the rabbis like us today who make a after blessing and all those things? What is it that you don't have to make a bracha at its conclusions? The Gemara says, la fuke mitzvah. It excludes mitzvahs, meaning when you do a mitzvah, you make a bracha before, but you don't have to do a bracha at its conclusion. But the Gemara asks on that, what about the b'nei ma'araba, the Westerners, the people from Israel, that after the filayu, they take off their tefillin, they make a special, they make a blessing after they, break a, uh, they, bring, they, they take off the tefillin, who has sanctified us and commanded us to observe his decrees. What does it exclude? So before I get to what it excludes, which is the next one, which is going to be number eight, what's this thing about making a uh, lishmar chukov when you take off your tefillin, what is that about? So, many of the, the interpreters understand this to mean that people used to wear the tefillin all day. There's a debate in the Talmud whether you, uh, of, of tefillin, if Lila is man tefillin, who, if evening is the time of tefillin or not. So they, they, they would take the tefillin off before nightfall and they would say, Lishmar Chukov, meaning I'm, I'm guarding the, the decree, which is not just to put on film, but also that I must take it off now. Today, many people have the custom to do that in Uval Let me see. Um, I saw some interesting things. Rabbi Soloveitchik says about that. So he quotes Tosos and says there's two reasons that our custom is not like the Westerners, like the people from Israel that used to make this special bracha when they take off the tefillin. Uh, a, we don't take, we don't wait till nightfall, so that's a practical reason. I guess already in the time of Tosos they weren't keeping the tefillin on all day. Um, and Another reason, in the name of Rabbeinu Tam, also in Tosos, that that why it's specifically by tefillin, okay, has to do with. Uh, when you take it off right by Shkia Sachama, when the sun is setting, when you're obligated to take it off. And there would be an essay if you put it on at that time. You would be over, you'd violate a positive commandment. Because it says, Vishamar Tzachachuka, you should guard the statutes. And guarding an essay is an essay. But Tzitzis, contrasted, even if you are Pater, because Lila is not necessarily a time of Tzitzis, there's no Isser. You don't have to take it off. Therefore, there'd be no bracha if you did take it off. Now, we don't necessarily follow the Bnei Marava. This is fascinating. Which means, in theory, even though we don't put on filling at night, but it's not because we agree with them that on principle that Lila loves on filling. It just could be because whatever, at night we can't guard ourselves. That's interesting. 
Um, so Tosis is basically saying it could be that theoretically we could have film. Here's a good question if you're a Kabbalah. Let's say you meet somebody, you're in the airport, you have a night flight, you get to talking to them, they're totally like mesmerized by what you have to say. And they say, Rabbi, like I was never bar mitzvah. And I'm flying back to Alaska. Would you, uh, you know, what do I need to do for a bar mitzvah? Because I'm never going to see a Jew again in my life. So there's a special thing called the karkata, the lomana tefillin. It's not so good for somebody who never put on tefillin. You got, you got to put it on at least once in your life. So here you're at the airport. It's 11 o'clock at night. Should you put tefillin on the guy? It's pitch black. There's a Rabbeinu Tam here that says, we, our, our custom is not to put on, but not because Me'ikar Adin, that Lila loves one tefillin him. Can you rely on that Rabbeinu Tam to at least put on tefillin once in this guy's life? I know the answer is no, but maybe, maybe yes. Ask a Rav. This is something to have a conversation with somebody about. It's not so simple. Because there is an Isser de Rabbana. The, the, the decree is an Isser de Rabbana because we, you might sleep within them. How strict is that Isser de Rabbana? Does it... I guess if you missed Phil and you missed Phil in that day and it's terrible, you, you shouldn't put on even though you missed it at night. But what about a Karkafta? Can you be over an Isidur Abanan to save the person from being a Karkafta or not? L'chara not, but ask a Rav. Ask a Rav. A lot of times we don't take any chances, not because we keep Allah, but because we just never bother asking a Rav. There's a lot of people who could save a lot of grief if they asked Rabbanan more shyless instead of just always Ramachman and everything. They'd rather live in ignorance than in things. I'm not telling you what's right or wrong here. I don't know. It's just a shayla. It's a valid shayla based on this Tysus. Anyway, the point that Rabbi Soloveitchik says, it, it, the, 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 what comes out from this Tysus is not the point I was making about asking a rub about putting on Phil in the Karkafta at night, is it seems that you only make this bracha after the doing of a mitzvah if there would be an iser, a forbidden element, it would be forbidden, not just because the rabbis suggest not to do it, or tell you not to do it, but an actual doraisa prohibition, or in this case, an essay that you'd be violating, uh, to continue to do that mitzvah. And since the Bnei Eretz Yisrael did make that bracha when they took their tefillin off right before nightfall, that, that's part and parcel because they held that Lila loves on tefillin hill. Uh, nighttime is not a time of tefillin, and you'd be over an essay. Okay. Also, on the other hand, without that isser, without agreeing to that principle of it being forbidden from the Torah, so we wouldn't make that bracha. The question is, what's the what's the hagdara? What's the categorization of this law? Of not making a blessing when you when you f finish a mitzvah, unless finishing it is part and parcel of not violating a prohibition that would affect you had you continued to do the mitzvah. Because really, lishma chukav is just a it's a birchas mitzvah, it's a blessing on a mitzvah. What what difference is it if I'm ending the mitzvah because the Torah told me to end it or the rabbis told me to end it? I'm ending it, so make a, a bracha for it. And, and the idea of making a bracha to not be over on, on an iser is strange. Not to not violate something. So the explanation Rav Soloveitchik gives that there's a certain kiyam, there's a certain, a person is fulfilling something at, at by the concluding moment as they're about to finish with the tefillin and take it off. What's the, what, what, what is that mitzvah? Just like you're commanded to put it on, you're commanded to take it off. You have to take it off now. So because that kind of creates a boundary that, that 
gives significance to that moment. And it has a finality of the mitzvah. In the beginning, you make a bracha over Las Yasin right before you do the mitzvah, and now you make a bracha right at the conclusion of the mitzvah. It's a maisa mitzvah. It's now considered an act of a mitzvah. Fascinating concept. And by doing that, they're also being lishma chukah. They're guarding the, the, the statutes. The Kedushas Tefillin, the, the sanctity of Tefillin. As part of putting on Tefillin is also guarding the holiness of Tefillin. You know, to how you are in the Tefillin, what you do in the Tefillin. And, and that's part and parcel of the Misa, the Etz of Mitzvah Tefillin, the essence of the Mitzvah Tefillin. Okay, let me bring some proofs for it. Okay, that's that's it for Rabbi Soloveitchik for now. But I'll just mention that there are some commentaries that say that the Bnei Marava they made this this after blessing not just necessarily on film. It's an example. They made it on many mitzvahs. In fact, it's brought down that certain Rishonim would make a bracha on mitzvahs at, at its conclusion. After shaking the little of after finishing in a sukkah, they'd make a spat up for this bracha, lishma chukav, or, or, or a tailor-made bracha to, you know, whatever that they were concluding. So, so uh, we don't practice that, but it's a fascinating concept. That obviously is not like Rabbeinu Tam that, uh, in the Tosis that, that uh, Rabbi Salvechik was explaining, because there's no, I mean, there's no need to, finish with your lulav you know you finish when you finish it's not like uh you are now required to put it down or else you're over on an issue so that obviously has a whole nother explanation which is it'll lead us to number eight um usually there could be this concept when you 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 say goodbye you say goodbye to a mitzvah with the bracha according to that opinion the name Rabbah. And the way some Rishonim understand it in a broader context, not just for Tefillin, but other mitzvahs. Because you're now concluding, and conclusion has significance. You also say, Abirchad HaMazon, or Ala Mechia, or Ala Eitz, all the, the grace after meals, both the, the bigger and smaller versions. Because you're satisfied and you ate. So you just like you, you make a, a bracha before, you make a bracha after. What's the exceptions? The Gemara says, Reach, Recha. Afuki rechani to exclude when you smell something fragrant. Why? What's the difference? You you benefited from something, so why not make a, a blessing after you you smell something delicious? It's a, it's a delicious smell. The answer, the simple answer, is you you didn't get satisfied. You you got you got a sense of pleasure, but it's fleeting. You didn't you didn't actually eat anything that will bring you. Uh, something in your stomach, so to speak. So, but let's go a little bit deeper with the concept that the uh, the one sen- the one of the the senses that we have that was not nifgam, that wasn't blemish in the chet etzadas in the uh, sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, is the sense of smell. You know, every there, there, there's an interesting related concept which is when it comes to brachot, you could, you could fulfill somebody else's obligation by making a bracha for them, even if you don't have an obligation yourself. For example, Kiddush, Abdullah, you could have already made Kiddush, you could have already made Abdullah, but you could make it for somebody else who wants to be Yotze. Why? All, we're all guarantors for, for one another. Because, because you're obligated, I'm a little bit obligated to help you fulfill your obligation, even though technically I did it already. But when it comes to birchad hananin, when it comes to blessings for pleasure, we don't say that. We say if you eat, you make a blessing. If you don't eat, you don't make a blessing. I can't make a blessing for you and I'm not eating. I can't make a most of the when I don't have any bread. It doesn't work like that. So the question is, why not? Well, the simple answer is because it's not, a, I, you have to eat. You're the one who's hungry. You're eating. I already ate. I don't have to eat. In other words, the spiritual realm, we are have, we have, uh, interconnectivity, 
But the physical realm, we each have what we have and need what we do and do what we do. We can't fulfill. I, I can't bless you to be full while I'm eating. And I can't bless you to, you know, have a blessed meal and make the, and, and sanctify your food by making a blessing when I'm not eating. Either we're sharing or we're not. That's a very important lesson when it comes to, in a sense, the, the physical separates us and but brings us together when we share. That's a real thing. Prayer, mitzvot, filin, tefillah, all of those things, they unite us without having to do anything other than our hearts and our words. But when it comes to physical things, we need to unite in our appreciation. Why? Very simple. If I bless you, I make the blessing on the bread for your bread. There's a chance what that represents is when it comes to bread, if we're not willing to share, everyone's on their own. There's a potential where people are in it for themselves. And by not sharing, there's a certain selfishness. I'm eating the bread, you're not. You're eating the bread, I'm not. It's one or the other. It's a scarcity mentality. And therefore, it's not a bracha. Bracha is bountiful, but is plenty. So when it comes to reach, when it comes to smell, first of all, we smell the same thing. It doesn't take away from it. So in that sense, there's no bracha afterwards because it also doesn't have the danger that physical food has, the fight over money and power that bread and food represents. And that's because it's ruchni which could mean why, for the most part, we don't make a bracha after a mitzvah with this rare exception of tefillin, lishma by the, uh, you know, by the B'nai Marava. According to most interpreters, it's limited to that, to that group, to that mitzvah. Because a mitzvah is elevating us. We don't need to guard it at the end. Food needs to be guarded in the beginning and the end because there's more room for negotiating our separatenesses. But we have to bond before and after. We have to bond over it. But Ruchni and Reach have something in common. Therefore, you don't need to have the blessing at the end. Number nine is eggs are better than any other food, ounce per ounce. This is a very interesting, Gemara. Um, Rabbi Yanai says in the name of Rabbi, Kol Shehu Kebetza, anything like an egg, the size of an egg, Beitza Tavim Mena, the egg is better. The egg is the best food, the most healthy food. Now, is this a fact? I know eggs have a lot of protein, they're good and stuff, unless you have high cholesterol, then maybe it's not good to have too many eggs. But the point, and, and, and generally you have to be careful not to have too many eggs, but okay, it's very interesting that the Talmud says this. And then the Talmud goes on for, for over half a page to discuss like health and remedies and dangers which leads us to number 10, which is health in the Talmud. The truth is, there's a lot of pages of Talmud spent on remedies and health that has very little understanding, a carryover of what could be applied today. Some people say, just ignore it. Other people say, no, we have to understand it and try to apply it. And there's a third opinion which says, if you don't understand it, just leave it alone. If there's something useful in it, that, that is applicable today, figure it out. But in fact, there are some people who say that you shouldn't do any of the remedies in it, that you should dafka not listen to the Talmud remedies, because there's a chance that by listening to it, it won't have the desired effect that the Talmud says, well, and you'll come to be a kofri, you'll come to say you don't believe in Talmud because it didn't work. We don't know what it means, we don't apply them, and therefore just, in order not to test your faith, don't try them at home. There's an actual opinion that says that, because there's some people who read anything in any text, they want to do it, They're going to, and, and there's some very weird things here. The bottom line is, the thing we can learn is that the Gemara does spend an inordinate amount of time concerned with one's health. What we could do, as Mana says, we could, it, a lot of people see religion and health as like being two separate things. I don't know why, whether it's COVID or just obesity, I, I've talked for myself, I have to lose weight and I'm refusing to. Uh, but the point only is, is that we don't have to make this. The Talmudists didn't see this as a contradiction. They saw health as being very important. They had no problem taking up time and energy dealing with trying to be healthier. And we need to do that too. We may not have all the answers, but we have to try to lead healthier lives. And uh, 
Let's uh, celebrate learning and living healthy together with blessings.